Okay, here we are in the Port of Liverpool building. It's a 1907 construction, Portland stone facade, concrete superstructure, uh, an excellent example of Edwardian Baroque. So we're very lucky to be here and I'm on the fourth floor, just below the cupola. Magnificent blue colour. Do come in and have a look as part of your tour of the three graces along the front of Pier Head down at by the Mersey. So what I thought I'd talk to you about today is Eves and Eves and the citation for that case is 1975 one weekly law reports at page 1338. It's an incredibly important case in the, the continuum of treatment of common intention constructive trusts and in particular it's a very early authority uh, that emanates from Lord Denning in the Court of Appeal. Uh, uh, and the facts briefly stated are these. We had Janet Eaves on the one hand, who is the mistress of Stuart Eaves, and they are a cohabiting couple. Stuart is already married, so um, he has a slight problem because, of course, he probably didn't want his wife to know about the home ownership that occurred with... Um, Janet Eves, you'd think. However, nevertheless, what occurred, and I should say Janet Eves, that, that's the name she took, but they weren't technically married. Um, but what occurred was, of course, that Stuart Eves placed the property in his own name. That's to say, then, this is a sole legal owner case, uh, which is, of course, problematic for Janet Eves because subsequently they split up. But she tried to mount, of course, an argument that she was entitled to some form of beneficial interest in the property because she'd acted to her detriment. And as we saw in Gissing and Gissing, the subject matter of a separate equity short, that is important. And the activity she had done, you'll forgive me, I hope, for referring to the case because the activity was voluminous. It was this. She did a great deal of work, according to the Lord Day to the house and garden. She did much more than many wives would do. What does that mean? Don't judge law or history backwards. Think that this was a, an early 1970s case. So that perception by the Lord Denning may have been accurate at that time. She stripped the wallpaper in the hall. She painted woodwork in the lounge and kitchen. She painted the kitchen cabinets. She painted the brickwork in the front of the house. She broke up the concrete in the front garden. She carried pieces to a skip. She, with him, demolished a shed and put up a new shed. Indeed, there's even evidence adduced by the defendant's aunt that she wielded a spade in a much uh, more uh, frequent manner than one would perhaps expect of the time um, as well. So she definitely acted to her detriment. So when she mounts this claim for a beneficial interest, it comes for Lord Denning and the rest of the panel in the Court of Appeal and they have to determine whether or not that activity means that she does have a form of interest. Uh, an interest which is equitable of course because the legal title is only in his name. He deployed an argument that because she was, 20, uh, was not 21, she was sub-21, that the legal title couldn't be put in their joint names that in itself is, of course, an excuse which perhaps indicates that he is manifesting uh, 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 an intention that uh, he knows she should have some form of interest. So that fact, coupled with her activity, was enough for the Lord Denning and his brethren in the Court of Appeal to state or hold order that she would have a one-quarter interest in that property. Do engage with the case. There are some other interesting facts. You'll see that Gloria, the mistress, who is the subsequent partner of Stuart Eves, gets up to some nefarious conduct, as does Stuart Eves himself, when he bars up the house uh, uh, and takes the refrigerator and the, the carpets, despite the fact that there are two children in the house with, with Janet Eves. Of course, he also doesn't pay maintenance. Um, as well so perhaps think about the maxim coming to equity with clean hands when you're thinking about some of his conduct of course it wasn't him coming to equity though it was janet 
Eves. So that's Eves and Eves. Have a think about that. Have a think about Lord Denning's deployment of the new model constructive trust. Now it sits in the continuum with Gissing, Cook and Head, Eves and Eves, Stack and Dowden, Jones and Kerno, and our appreciation of, of that equitable device in the context of the family home. So from here in the Port of Liverpool building, I bid you goodbye. Goodbye. Okay, so here we are with another Lord Denning contribution to constructive trusts, particularly common intention constructive trusts. And of course, it's the case of Eves and Eves, 1975, we can see the weekly law reports, and then page 1338. So here is the title of the case, Janet Eves against Stuart Eves, we know are the protagonists. There's Denning on the panel as the master of the roles, with Lord Justice Brown and Mr Justice Brightman as his brethren on the bench. So there are our catchwords. It's a constructive trust case, as we know, and also an inference case, as I've highlighted. So we're looking at the conduct between two parties to determine whether or not that is sufficient to give a beneficial interest to the female in this instance, that's to say Janet. So then we descend into the head note, as you can see, and we've got the facts there. I've highlighted some for you that are interesting. Uh, of course, it's all interesting, but these are just trying to highlight some little bits for the purpose of this equity short. So we can see the value of the house there. Um, uh, but this bit here, this is key because this is the excuse element that Stuart Eves deployed to cause the property to be registered in his sole name. So this is a sole name case. And of course he says to her, had she been 21 years of age, she was lower than that, uh, younger I should say, she was 19, he would have had the house put in their joint names as it was to be their joint home. In other words, why would you need to come up with an excuse other than if you recognised that that other person might have a legitimate claim? Uh, not at law, perhaps, but in equity. So we descend down a bit now, a bit further along. We get an indication of some detrimental activity here. The plaintiff and the defendant made their home together there. And she did much work, some of it very heavy to the house and garden. Our first indicator of activity there in the head note. We descend a bit further to the outcome. So in the head note here, held, allowing the appeal from Penny Quick at first instance, that a trust had been created because the defendant had led the plaintiff to believe that she was to have an interest in the house. The property had been acquired and maintained by the parties for use for their joint benefit. It could be inferred from the condition of the house and the work that the plaintiff did to it that it was part of the bargain that she should contribute her labour to its improvement. In other words, her activity, the labour, was sufficient to found an interest uh, and that she relied to her detriment on that understanding. It goes on. Uh, the court should imply that the plaintiff was intended to acquire a quarter interest in the property. And the declaration should be made that the defendant held the legal estate on trust as to three quarters for himself and one quarter for the plaintiff. So that's the catch words after the title, the head note. We then descend further down through the cases that are cited. I've highlighted some elements for you. So there's Janet Eves, the plaintiff. Stuart Eves, as we'll see some strange conduct by him. And then the property itself that we're arguing about. The legal estate in 39 Broadhurst Avenue. We descend further and we get to the judgment of the Lord Denning. Here, and this dispute between Eves and Eve Stuart on the one hand. Here again is the property details. And we get a bit of dialogue there about how the house would be used. And I've touched on the excuse element already. 
particularly there we see that in the witness box he admitted that that 21 years of age point was an excuse, mainly so or solely so that he could get the property in his name. Then we've got a much fuller exposition here of the work she did. And of course we saw in the head notes, so she did a great deal of work to the house and gardens. She did much more than many wives would do. She stripped the wallpaper in the hall. She painted woodwork in the lounge and kitchen. She painted the kitchen cabinets. She painted the brickwork in the front of the house. She broke up the concrete in the front garden. She carried the pieces to a skip. She, with him, demolished a shed and put up a new shed. She prepared the front garden for turfing. In other words, she did a heck of a lot of activity. Uh, not quite so much, perhaps, well, he wasn't as moved, was the Lord Denning, as he was in Cook and Head. Um, but, of course, he does recognise here that she, she worked pretty damn hard. Then it goes on. I've drawn out for you the idea that, of course, their relationship comes to an end. Why? Well, that's because... Stuart meets Gloria, who becomes his wife in due course. Of course, Gloria and Janet don't get on mainly because of, uh, well, Gloria loses a temper, as we'll see. Um, but not before that occurred, of course, we see this nefarious conduct by Stuart. He did not keep up his maintenance payments. He went back to the house where Janet was with two children by this stage. He locked up two big rooms, leaving Janet and the children one bedroom and the kitchen and toilet. He takes away the deep freeze and the carpet. There's two children in the house. It goes on. Uh, there's the bit about Gloria being upset, raising a voice at Janet, making her feel angry, saying that, uh, upset rather, that she wouldn't get a penny out of Stuart. Threatens Janet with violence. Janet gets upset. She doesn't want to stay in the house, so she leaves, whereupon Stuart and Gloria move in with an Alsatian dog. Well, there are the facts. We then start to get into the meat of the law, and as you can see here, I've highlighted for you the strictness of the legal position that Denning starts to look to, um, but then the, the ameliorating effect of equity. So here we go, and a few years ago, even equity would not have helped her. But things have altered now. Equity is not past the age of childbearing. One of her latest progeny is a constructive trust of a new model. Lord Diplock brought it into the world and we have nourished it. Excellent. This phrase here from Gissing and Gissing, which of course makes up a separate equity short, this clause, this extracted paragraph from the judgment, or the opinion, I should say, of the Lord Diplock in Gissing and Gissing, absolutely sums up the position that we find ourselves in at that stage in the early 70s. In particular here, the last little bit, and he will be held so to have conducted himself if by his words or conduct he's induced the SETI K trust to act to his own detriment in the reasonable belief that by so acting he was acquiring a beneficial interest in the land. That is, of course, exactly what Janet Eves thought was occurring when she was doing all that physical labour to which we've referred, which we've highlighted here. So we go back to this deployment of the House of Lords Authority in Gissing by the Lord Denning. We think that's our test, or of course Denning does as well. Uh, and then we see that although she did make financial contributions, she has, by her efforts, done enough to obtain an interest. And also that Eves, Stuart Eves himself, by his activity, helped uh, towards that end. And then, of course, we get the calculation. Uh, and it's much the same as Cook and Head. So we see here that we get uh, uh, a one-quarter share to Janet. Do read Brown's judgment as well, of course, when you're thinking about eaves and eaves. Think about that term of art that you can perhaps keep in your head in terms of equity is not past the age of childbearing uh, and what that means. Not just in the area of common intention constructive trusts, but in equity generally, and also Mull on Brightman's activity. 
So that's Eves and Eves in a nutshell. Have a look at that. Enjoy the case. Think about the Lord Denning sat there in the Court of Appeal in 1975 and see how you can fit Eves and Eves in the continuum of treatment across the, uh, the subject of common intention constructive trusts. So on that point, I would wish you, and do wish you, goodbye. Goodbye.